Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Tilly. It's good to be here. So I'm going to start with a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, AI has been having a, a big impact on the capital markets, on enterprise mm -hmm. uh, expectations of, of where their business is going to go over the last, particularly over the last three or four years. Can you talk a little bit about what that means in the telco context, if we think of telecoms operators and their expectations around where AI might impact and transform their businesses? Yeah, I think it's a good, it's a good question, Tilly, um, and it is a big one. Um, I think it's worthwhile noting this AI boom and this investment cycle is actually coming not long off the back of the 5G investment cycle for telcos. So that, that's, that's really something that's quite important. And we see across the, the worldwide industry for telcos that those CapEx and OpEx expenditure profiles are still normalizing, you know. And so most operators will have a target of between 12 to 16% CapEx, and that's still coming down following the 5G investment cycle. Um, but we think it's quite important to start initially with the larger expenditure, which is OpEx, and around 50% of that is actually on network operations. That provides a pretty good target for some of these AI opportunities. Uh, I don't want to call them low-hanging fruit, but um, it's a pretty good place to start. So the context here is operators are still coming off the back of significant spend on, on 5G, but actually it's OPEX where a lot of their investment is going and particularly OPEX around running the networks. And so that's the the kind of the target for you or the, the thing that you think could be transformative with AI and telco is if it can really impact, move the needle in the network ops bucket. Right, right. And I think efficiency with OPEX is one angle, but productivity is another. And so um, I wouldn't necessarily say you're going to see you know, huge amounts of layoffs. Initially, many operators are running teams, you know, with after these latest rounds of cuts that have already already been pulled quite back. So so a lot of that can actually be more efficient use of the OPEX um, and have those teams be more productive in terms of um, what they're getting from it. And we have been working on research together and we've been putting out some new terms into mm -hmm. the industry, which we think are useful and move the yeah. conversation forward. Yeah. One of them is around dual intelligence. Right. And then we've been breaking that down into reasoning and analytical AI. And so perhaps for those that are less informed, it would be good to get a bit of a, an overview of how you would define those terms and maybe why you think they're they're useful in conceptualizing the opportunity for, for telcos. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say, why, why do we want dual intelligence at all? Well, mm -hmm. There's two parts, right? So there's the Gen AI part, which we've been talking about since uh, OpenAI launched ChatGPT. Now, the, the improvements in reasoning over the last six to 12 months really bring us to this idea of agents uh, and agentic AI. So that, that's really important. So that's one of the intelligences. But there's another part which is fundamental to if you are unlocking or removing the ceiling from those agents, and that is the analytical AI. Now, we've had analytical AI. We've been using it for a long time in the form of machine learning. Mm -hmm. 15 years plus of machine learning algorithms being deployed in production at scale. What's new? Well, time series foundation models are new. And that's something that is very much complementary to LLMs and to Gen AI and Agentic AI. So that's, that's the idea of where dual intelligence comes from. Um, and if we think about it, you know, it could be a way of saying these agents where we're getting a lot of focus will have a ceiling removed for them because if we can improve the signal to noise ratio with the analytical AI from the data we're already collecting. And why are time series foundation models so interesting in the context of network operations? What is it about network data that makes a good match between these types of, of AI? Yeah, well, the, the, um, the observation really is LLMs have not been built to handle time series data. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as we know, you know, language, video, audio, 
everything along those lines. So, so our agents, that's what they're working off of. Yeah. Um, so what you need is something that understands time, understands time series data, but then you also need something that can handle the variety and the scale mm -hmm. of telco data, of mm -hmm. network data. And that is something that we need something that's efficient. Um, and that's where the time series foundation models come in. Small models, um, very efficient and different from machine learning. They can handle different data types within the one model. That's going to be a big unlock. Yeah. And potentially allows for smarter reasoning across network domains, across different types of network equipment providers, and kind of more in line with the reality of what we know is out there for most major operators, which is a, a real mix and heterogeneous kind of environment within their networks. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just like um, our network engineers today are kind of stuck having to interpret the data because of issues with the signal to noise, you know, what's a false positive? Can this be trusted? Um, often stitching data together from different systems. And so that inefficiency, you know, being picked up by your agents is still a, a big inefficiency. And so that's what we'll get with the analytical AI. And can you talk a little bit more about the vision for the way that AI and humans will interact specifically in the networking domain, maybe now, but also how that might evolve over the next few years. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that. You know, that's important to think about the partnership. You know, human and AI partnership is going to be key, um, and we need to build that in stages. Um, so the first part we talked about a second ago is let's let's just acknowledge where engineers are today and many of them don't trust the data they get from their existing systems they need to check it that's been a limiting factor to how they've deployed automation because you don't want automation to run away and make a problem worse so that trust is is kind of fundamental so as we improve that signal to noise ratio and engineers get to see it they yeah, get to see that it does what their existing systems do and more um, and it does it better, then that's going to allow them to feel more comfortable to have the agents, the automation react to that. Um, and then on the agentic side, everything that we're, you're hearing about in the industry is fundamentally important, guardrails, um, you know, standardized context and prompts, um, things like benchmarking um, to catch hallucinations, um, all of this explainability, clear reasoning steps, the ability for a human in the loop to interact, to accept uh, proposed uh, hypotheses and remediation plans and automations. This ultimately needs to be worked through so people build trust over time. And they do that across the variety of different uh, events that will occur in the network and a variety of different automations that they might want to uh, you know, take to remediate that event. And can you tell me a little bit about IBM's role in this, what you've been doing and what you've been learning maybe from from the work that you, you're kind of doing with operators at the moment? Yeah, I think we're, we've been very fortunate. Um, IBM is independent in the industry. So we're able to meet our clients, the operators, where they are, you know, with whatever systems, whatever data, whatever network equipment they've got deployed. Um, and so that that's a real advantage. And what we've tried to do because it's to focus on the hard problems. You know, what are the things that are clear distinguishing factors from the existing systems? That's going to help people get to, you know, a proof point, you know, and ROI has a role to play, don't get me wrong, but there's there's got to be these proof points. And when you're being innovative, you don't want to, you know, constrain that innovation by saying, where's my value, right? So the proof points will really come, well, does this system find what my existing system is finding, you know, with better accuracy? But we see there's actually some other opportunities, which can it find things my existing system didn't find, what we call so-called hidden issues. But can it also start to give me early warning to issues as things are degrading? Those are easy things to distinguish from what you're getting today. And then you layer on top of that 
the reasoning, the agentic automation, which is going to feed off of that better quality signal. And we've seen that with an operator in, in APAC, actually. We were able, using the algorithms, to find an issue that their existing systems didn't find. And their, their users had to call up and complain about. And, and it really does come down to that, being able to track the data as it comes in and have the time series foundation model pick up you know, sudden changes that wouldn't have generated an alert or wouldn't have hit a threshold. Thanks so much for that, Ben. And I would really encourage anybody who's interested in the conversation we've just had to check out the research that we've done together to learn a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, Tilly. Great chatting to you today.